Hello, my name is Stefan Watzka. I am thoracic surgeon at the North Hospital in Vienna, Austria. It is my pleasure today to talk about multimodal treatment of malignant pleural mesothelioma. Pleural mesothelioma, which was first described in 1960 for workers at an asbestos mine in South Africa, is a neoplastic disease of the pleura, which is mainly associated with exposure to asbestos. It is characterized by aggressive local growth, a limited response to therapy, and a very poor prognosis. As a matter of fact, according to the SEER database, the average five-year survival in the United States is around 8%, which is also due to the fact that most patients are diagnosed only in advanced tumor stages. The incidence of pleural mesothelioma varies between 1 and 30 cases per 1 million people in the year, and the trend is increasing, with at least 70% of those affected having a positive asbestos history. Men are affected by pleural mesothelioma up to eight times more often than women. A special feature of pleural mesothelioma is the extremely long latency period between exposure to asbestos and the development of a clinically manifest disease. It is 20 to 50 years. However, it must be emphasized that a missing asbestos history does not rule out the presence of pleural mesothelioma. In case of doubt, one should always opt for further diagnostic workup. Procedolite type asbestos fibers are mainly responsible for the development of pleural mesothelioma. Since the relatively long asbestos needles can only be incompletely phagocytosed by the macrophages in the pleura, chronic pleuritis develops, which due to the persistent release of inflammatory mediators can subsequently lead to the development of pleural mesothelioma. According to the WHO classification, Three different histological subtypes of pleural mesothelioma are essentially distinguished. The epithelial subtype with 50% of cases, the sarcomatoid subtype with 15%, and the biphasic subtype, which contains morphological elements of the two aforementioned subtypes with 35% of cases. These histological subtypes also differ significantly in prognosis. For the following considerations, the clinical practice guidelines published by the American Society of Clinical Oncology in 2018 will particularly be taken into account. These guidelines are prepared by an expert panel consisting of oncologists, thoracic surgeons, radiotherapists, pulmonologists, radiologists, and pathologists, and are based on a literature review from 1990 to 2017. The endpoints of the recommendations are overall survival, recurrence with survival, and quality of life. The initial symptoms of pleural mesothelioma are mostly unspecific. Patients can present with the following symptoms dyspnea, irritating cough, diaphragmatic elevation, the chest x ray, unclear pleural effusions, spontaneous pneumothorax in old age, chronic chest pain, fatigue. It is not uncommon for pleural mesothelioma to be discovered as a coincidental finding in the context of routine clarification in patients who are generally symptom-free. Because of the very long latency between asbestos exposure and disease onset, the exploration of the occupational history must go far into the patient's past. As a first step in the case of clinical suspicion, a chest CT must be performed. The changes that may show up are typical, but also not part of mnemonic, diffuse or nodular thickening of the pleura, encapsulated pleural effusions without relevantly increased inflammation parameters disseminated pulmonary round nodules. As an example, you can see here typical radiological alterations in a right-sided mesothelioma. Since chest CT <clears throat> cannot confirm or rule out the presence of pleural mesothelioma, histological confirmation of diagnosis is essential, preferably by diagnostic bats or thoracotomy with extensive biopsy of the parietal pleura. Alternatively, according to the ASCO guidelines, a cytological diagnosis can also be obtained from the pleural effusion, or a CT-guided needle biopsy of the pleural lesions can be carried out if the patient should not tolerate an operation. The following markers are diagnostic in immunohistochemistry, carotinin, keratin 5 to 6, WD1 if positive, as well as CEA, EPCAM, Claudin 4, and TTF1 if negative. Due to insufficient sensitivity and specificity and partly lack of standardization, the collection of biomarkers and the implementation of genome analysis are currently not recommended by the ASCO guidelines. A chest CT with contrast agent is required for staging, which should be evaluated according to the modified RESIST 1.1 guidelines. 
However, the theoretically promising measurement of tumor volume by CT is not recommended because it is not standardized. In order to rule out possible metastatic disease, a PET scan or alternatively a PET CT is an integral part of staging. Candidates for surgical therapy may also need an MRI, metastinoscopy, EBUS, or in some cases, even diagnostic laparoscopy for better assessment of the diaphragm. At the end of the staging process, the patient <clears throat> is assigned to a clinical stage based on the now valid eighth edition of the TNM system. In the new version of the TNM system, the previous T1A and T1B stages of the D descriptor were merged into a single T1 stage. The prognostic relevance of tumor, tumor thickness has been noted, but has not yet been integrated into the TNM system. With the end descriptor, the internal mammary artery lymph nodes, the peridiaphragmatic lymph nodes, the lymph nodes in the pericardial fat, and the intercostal lymph nodes were categorized for the first time as N1. These are the treatment modalities of pleural mesothelioma. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and pleurodesis on the conservative side, and microscopic complete resection and tumor debulking on the surgical side. It is important to emphasize that the optimal treatment for pleural mesothelioma is always multimodal. The combination of at least two treatment modalities, for example, chemotherapy and surgery, always produces better results than the exclusive use of single treatment modalities. Chemotherapy for pleural mesothelioma has been shown to prolong survival and improve quality of life. The neoadjuvant combination of cisplatin and pemetrexate is used as first-line therapy with four to six cycles. Chemotherapy can also be administered in an adjuvant setting. If the performance status is poor, therapy with a single substance can also be carried out. Second-line therapy is only recommended as part of clinical trials. A retreatment with cisplatin pemetrexate is generally possible if the disease has remained stable for more than six months after the first line therapy. But maintenance therapy with pemetrexate is not recommended by the ASCO guidelines. For asymptomatic patients with an epithelial subtype who have minimal disease and are not suitable for surgery, the ASCO guidelines 2018 now recommend wait and see. As for surgical treatment, the 2013 IMIC guidelines recommended a surgical site reduction only if macroscopic complete resection was achievable. The choice of the surgical procedure, EPP or EPD, was relegated to clinical factors and to the individual surgeon's experience. The ASCO guidelines 2018 are far more nuanced with regards to surgical treatment. Surgical indication is specified as follows. A maximum surgical site reduction is only indicated in selected early stage patients in the context of multimodal therapy and only with appropriate cardiopulmonary fitness, which implies, on the other hand, that surgical intervention should not be withheld from older but nonetheless fit patients. It must be emphasized that due to the diffuse growth of the disease, ideally only a microscopic and never a microscopic complete resection can be achieved. And therefore, there can be no R0 resection. For this reason, all current guidelines only speak of site reduction, not of resection. In any case, the ASCO 2018 guidelines generally list lung-saving procedures like EPD or PD or extra pleural pneumonectomy as possible surgical procedures for maximum surgical site reduction. Extended pleurectomy decortication or pleurectomy decortication are expressly recommended as the first line surgical therapy, especially since there's now overwhelming evidence that EPD is superior to EPB with regard to perioperative mortality or morbidity and long term survival. While extra <coughs> pleural pneumonectomy is only indicated in selected cases, for example, in the case of lung involvement, and only if there are no functional contraindications. In the case of diaphragmatic involvement and multifocal involvement of the chest wall, a surgical procedure is only indicated after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Clear contraindications to maximum surgical site reduction are involvement of the contralateral or supraclavicular lymph nodes, uh, equaling uh, N2 in the eighth edition of the TNM system, and M1 stage with contralateral thoracic or extra thoracic metastasis and the sarcomatoid subtype. An intracavitary therapy discussed in the literature, for example, intraoperative use of hypothermic thoracic chemotherapy or photodynamic therapy after completion of the maximum surgical site reduction, 
is currently recommended by the ASCO guidelines only in the context of controlled clinical trials as an extension of overall survival has not yet been conclusive, conclusively proven after such measures. In addition to the above mentioned procedures for maximum surgical set reduction, which basically follow a curative approach, the ASCO guidelines 2018 also recommend a range of palliative surgical procedures that are used for symptomatic pleural or bicardial effusion with ECOG performance status uh, equal or greater to if a maximum surgical site reduction is not feasible. This includes an indwelling permanent pleural or pericardial catheter, a VAT tumor debulking and or talc pleurodesis in the pericardial window. It must be emphasized that although these palliative measures do not have any impact on overall survival, they can result in a significant improvement in the quality of life for the patient. For this reason, the indications should be general and symptomatic stages. Radiotherapy in the multimodal setting of pleural mesothelioma therapy can reduce the local recurrence rate and can therefore be offered with good results after maximum surgical site reduction. A prophylactic radiation of the surgical access points, which was often recommended in the past, is obsolete according to the current data. But adjuvant radiotherapy makes sense if the access points are affected from the disease. In addition, radiotherapy should also be offered to asymptomatic patients with circumscribed local recurrence. In the palliative setting, radiotherapy can achieve long-term freedom from symptoms. And intensity modulated radiotherapy should be performed in selected patients, whereas after extra pneumonectomy, high dose radiotherapy is indicated. Neoadjuvant radiation therapy can still be regarded as an experimental procedure, generally not recommended if lung saving surgery is planned. As for the treatment of mesothelioma in our institution, the general principles are that after accurate diagnosis and staging, the decision about the best course of action will be made in our interdisciplinary tumor board. After a visit to Raja Flores 2009 at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, we devised a surgical strategy which encompasses lung saving surgery as primary surgical approach with extra pleural pneumonectomy only in the case of significant lung involvement. Lung saving surgery for mesothelioma encompasses complete resection of the parietal visceral pleura and of the mediastinal lymph nodes, in which case the operation in accordance with recent Eisler guidelines is termed pleurectomy decortication. If diaphragm and pericardium must be resected, it is termed extended pleurectomy decortication. In the later case, diaphragm and pericardium must be constructed with prosthetic impl implants. Here I present you an ultra short video clip showing a pleurectomy decortication for early stage epithelial mesothelioma. On the other hand, extra pleural pneumonectomy for mesothelioma encompasses complete resection of the parietal and visceral pleura of the lung, of the diaphragm, of the pericardium, and of the mediastinal lymph nodes. Diaphragm and pericardium must subsequently be reconstructed with prosthetic implants. Here, I give you a short overview of our institutional results. Since 2007, uh, since 2000, we treated 110 patients, predominantly male with epithelial subtype. 30% of our patients had an early stage disease and about 40% have been operated on. The results are as follows. All surgical patients had a three-year overall survival of 31% and a five-year overall survival of 23.6%, while patients after lung-saving surgery had even better results with a three-year overall survival of 38% and a five-year overall survival of 29.2%. 